Good morning. Good morning. Wonderful worship. Amen. Blessed week for sure. We had lots of fun. My favorite part, I said to the first service, firstly was just the joy. There was a significant, special, you know, just what we prayed for, if you think about it. Uh, joy of the Lord that was present on the faces of young and old, you know, all those serving. And it was just incredible. It was wonderful to see. By far the, the best VBS we've done yet. Uh, and may that be how we live our Christian life. I want this to be the best sermon I've ever delivered because it's now and it's today. I could care less about last week, right? Right? But tomorrow, the next one, the right now, my service to the Lord, I want it to be the best. And so it's a great testimony and it's true. Fantastic week of service to the Lord. Um, so I loved, I loved, I loved, I loved uh, Friday night, Delfina sharing the gospel um, with the kids. Just, just beautiful, wonderful. Let's open our Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 12. One more thing, pray, continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, amen? I forgot to mention at first service, uh, but continue to pray that the, uh, the fighting and the violence would stop. Pray for the Jewish people. Pray for the Palestinian people, amen? That was very quiet. They need Jesus too, amen? amen. So pray for peace. Pray for the fighting to stop. Pray that the Lord just... Uh, brings it to an end. Deuteronomy chapter 12, as we're in between books uh, in our study of the New Testament on Sunday mornings, we're going to take the opportunity to take a look at Deuteronomy 12. Uh, excited about next Sunday, we've got a, a special speaker coming to teach and share. Uh, looking forward to it, so thought we'd take some time. Title for our message is on the screen. Write it down if you would. Uh, what it is to worship. What it is to worship. Jot that in your bulletin, a couple of notes and points for you today to help us think through and understand what this text has to say, what it is to worship. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for, Lord, the authority of your Holy Spirit. We thank you that we will see you move and you work when we ask you to, Lord, and when we leave room for you. Lord, as always in our lives, we want to be flexible. We've got our schedule, our routine. Lord, so it could be said of a Sunday morning service. But we make room, we pause, we wait, we stop, we listen. We're sensitive at all times. Lord, through the work week, God, we're just sensitive. Even though we're working with our hands and typing with our fingers and walking with our feet, Lord, we're sensitive as your ambassadors to whatever you want to do, whatever you want to say, whenever, Lord, you choose to do it. And we thank you, Lord, that, that when we're sensitive, when we're prayerful and where we're sensitive in the moment, Lord, we'll see your Holy Spirit move. We'll hear your voice. We'll be used incredibly by you. And thank you that we've seen that already today, God. We've seen you move, Lord, through worship. Uh, we've seen you prepare uh, our hearts through the songs that you chose, God, for our message today that talk so much about intimacy, that talk about sincerity and honesty and worship as we've received amazing grace, that our lives are to be lived in light of that grace, pursuing holiness. God, being loyal to you, obedient, God, living before you. Thank you, Lord, as you've prepared the way, and we recognize that now. Lord, uh, so give weight to these words. Lord, so let them leave an impact on our lives. Lord, uh, let us not just simply come to a service and leave the same, but... Would you help our hearts to be open, Lord, to being exhorted, uh, encouraged, convicted? God, whatever we need today, Father knows best. Whatever you see fit, speak to us and help us to receive it, Lord. We thank you for the authority of your word. God, where we all stand on equal ground. Build us up, bear good fruit, Continue to bless us, Lord, as we do all that you've called us to do. In Jesus' name, let's say together, amen, and we say, amen. It is not possible for us to bless God because the one who is the blesser is greater than the one who is blessed. So how can we bless God? 
It begins when God blesses us, then we in turn bless Him for His goodness to us. When we bless God, we are giving back to Him what He deserves. Worship is giving the worth-ship to God that is due Him. Amen? Great statement. You know who said that? Jerry Falwell. How many of you remember him? Nice and high. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I thought. Not very many. Definitely on the more seasoned side of sainthood. Right? Jerry Falwell had to share that because it's fantastic. You young folks, you can ask the older ones later. They'll tell you all about him. Someone else said, Let the one who would worship God open his mouth in praise, his heart in receptivity, his mind in contemplation, his purse, fellas. That was a great joke. Come on, guys. His wallet in dedication. It's, it's old King James, but his purse in dedication and his hand in in fellowship. For you younger folks, uh, currently, uh, uh, contemporarily, uh, Mark Driscoll, quoting another author, said this in regard to worship. I have worked out a definition for worship that I believe covers every possible human condition. It is this. Worship is the continuous outpouring of all that I am, all that I do, and all that I ever become in light of a chosen or choosing God. Some good statements kind of describing and defining what worship is. Amen. I think we excel in today, and I wonder if you agree. I just suppose it to your consideration. But I find it interesting in contrast uh, uh, to these great definitions, explanations on what worship is, our culture certainly contrasts it today. There's a lot of confusion on what it is, especially in our American culture today, what it is to worship God. Many are quite confused. I think we can trace that uh, to a number of factors. Firstly, we live in a self-absorbed, self-centered culture, don't we? Primarily, we're self-centered. We're not God-focused. We're becoming increasingly intoxicated with ourselves. And I like that expression. We're in I just can't get enough of me. And we know that by the selfie. Our phones, the cameras used to face the other way, but now there's a button you can push and, oh, hello, my favorite person. And I can so easily, I don't have to like go like this, but I can just snap a picture of myself all day long. It's a sign of the times. The evidence is all around us. Culturally, we're also being progressively brainwashed, I think, about all that we're entitled to for no seemingly good reason. You're entitled to this and you're entitled to that. Why? I don't know. It just sounds good. It sells. Amen? To the point that these things, these cultural philosophies, phenomenon, if you will, they've infiltrated the church here in America primarily, I think. This is our culture. We claim responsibility for it, and we see its effect in what we call worship. And it seems that worship is more about us than it is about God. It's more about music, and it's about instruments, and it's about how things sound and how it all feels. How I feel rather than the facts, the truth, the glory of the gospel, all that God is, all that He's done for me. We've flipped things around terribly. A.W. Tozer said this, what is worship? Worship is to feel in your heart and express, hone in on this, and express in some, say that, appropriate manner. Bold them up. There it is. It's bolded. It's emboldened. Appropriate manner. Worship is to feel in your heart. I'd write that in your bulletin. And express in some appropriate manner. A humbling but delightful sense of admiring awe and astonished wonder and overpowering uh, powering love in the presence of that most ancient mystery, that majesty which philosophers call the first cause, but which we call, say it, our Father which art in heaven. I love those words. This is what we're going to base our study on today. Appropriate manner. Worship is to feel in your heart something and to then express it in an appropriate manner. That's Deuteronomy chapter 12. And you know, if you were with us as we have worked our way through the book of Deuteronomy on Wednesday night, I love this chapter. We're going to take some time in it today. For God is instructing His people, Israel, all about what worship is what is appropriate worship to him. 
And frankly, that's all that should matter to us as Christians. Amen? What worship is to God, not what I think about it, not how I feel in regard to it, but what the scriptures declare worship to be and how God says that it's meaningful to him. If it's about him, if it's for him, then it must be directed by him. Amen? For me, this section of scripture starts with verse 26 of Deuteronomy 11. Glance back up in your Bibles with me, if you would. We remember it wasn't till the third century, do you know this? Bible Trivia Fact Sunday. Ready? It wasn't until the third century, I believe, that chapter divisions and verses were inserted. So we could say, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 26. These were one continuous writing, the Old Testament and New. And so I believe there's connectivity between chapter 12, verse 1, what we're going to study today and what we read here in verse 26 of chapter 11. It's a real simple choice that God reminds his people he's given them the freedom to make. And this is important for we Christians today. It's what separates uh, legalistic excuses from Christian responsibility. Do you follow? Maybe I'll elaborate in just a minute. God says it so simply. He says, Behold, I set before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and the curse, if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way which I command you today to go after other gods which you have not known. The same that was true for Israel then is true for you and me today. God has given us the freedom to make a choice. Choose for yourself this day who you're going to serve, right? Every single day, especially on a Sunday, as we're celebrating and receiving the word of the Lord, we have a choice to make. God has given us that freedom, that privilege, and it's awesome. Amen? Make a choice. Moses says, speaking for the Lord, but make a good one. Not choosing is a choice in and of itself. Amen? Far from legalism. It's not a trip that we're about to take this morning. A legalistic trip. It's simply the truth. It's God's heart on the practicality of worship. And you are free as a Christian to do with it what you will. That's what Moses says here. That's what God declares. But as we'll read in a moment, Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, let's just read it now. Moses says, it's on the screen, Today I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Oh, and there's an appeal here. God, through the Holy Spirit, is speaking the same thing, I think, to us today. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your kids, your family, your posterity, your descendants might live. The choice is yours. Yet, I appeal to you to make a wise choice as it pertains to worship, what it is, practically speaking, and every other point and principle that the Word of God speaks. Amen? The choice is yours to make. You'll be blessed if you, if you listen to it, if you take it as treasure, make it your own, follow it through, and you'll certainly be lacking something. A curse just very well may come through saying, that doesn't apply to me, or I don't really care for what that passage has to say. It's not for me, for someone else. There's a blessing if you do and a curse if you don't. Something that will be missing in your life. And so that should cause us, that reminder, this freedom, this choice that I get to make every single day to devote my life to the Lord or just not, it should exhort me, it should push me, it should pull me to lay the Word of God, especially Deuteronomy 12, where we're at today, to lay it over my life like an outline and just follow anything that I read, all that I see, all that I hear, because God will bless me. Amen? Most often we say something silly like, well, how will God bless me? With bucks and BMWs and boomerangs, bookmarks, no laughter. Any other B words? 
I don't know how God will bless you. Moses doesn't say it here. God doesn't spell it out specifically. But here's a word of wisdom. Father knows best. Amen? I don't know how he's going to bless you, but Father knows best and he's going to bless you. So trust him to give to you what's good for you and to withhold from you whatever's not healthy for you. Our part is this, uh, Psalm 37, 4, David says so simply, my responsibility as a Christian is to delight myself also in the Lord. Delight yourself in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Perfect expression, great balance, focus yourself, Christian, on just delighting yourself in the Lord, doing all that he declares for you to do. And you'll just be blessed in the end. The desires of your heart that you didn't even know were there, God's going to give. And so the choice is ours. But Moses says here, choose wisely, please. Choose wisely. Ignore these things at your own peril. Amen? Amen? Well, all that being said, can we stand together and read our text for today? Deuteronomy 12.1, and I'm going to be reading this in the New Living Translation so it imparts a little more understanding. Don't worry, we're not going soft. Just desiring that all would understand. Amen? Now get ready, it's a big section of text. It's 19 verses. I'm going to read like the old micro-machine guy. You remember him? You older folks do. All my jokes are getting dated. We're going to cover it quickly, but that's why we're going to stand. You'll thank me later. As we work our way through this text, let's, let's dig in. Verse 1, Deuteronomy 12. Moses says to God's people, these are the decrees and regulations. You must be careful to obey when you live in the land that the Lord, the God of your ancestors, is giving you. You must obey them as long as you live. When? You drive out the nations that live there. You must destroy all the places where they worship their gods. High on the mountains, up on the hills, under every green tree, break down their altars and smash their sacred pillars. Burn their Asherah poles and cut down their carved idols. Completely erase the names of their gods. Do not worship the Lord your God in the way these pagan peoples worship their gods. Rather, you must seek the Lord your God at the place of worship. He himself will choose from among all the tribes the place where his name will be honored. There you will bring your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, your sacred offerings, your offerings to fulfill a vow, your voluntary offerings, and your offerings of the firstborn animals of your herds and flocks. There you and your families will feast in the presence of the Lord your God, and you will rejoice in all you've accomplished because the Lord your God has blessed you. Verse 8, your pattern of worship will change today all of you are doing as you please because you've not yet arrived at the place of rest. The land your, the Lord your God is giving you is a special possession, but you will soon cross the Jordan River and live in the land the Lord your God is giving you when he gives you rest from all your enemies and you're safely living in the land. You must bring everything I command you, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, your sacred offerings. Your offerings to fulfill a vow to the designated place of worship, the place the Lord your God chooses for his name to be honored. You must celebrate there, as we are today, in the presence of the Lord your God with your sons and daughters and all your servants. And remember to include the Levites who live in your towns, for they will receive no allotment of land among you. Be careful, Moses says, not to sacrifice your burnt offerings just anywhere you like. You may do so only at the place the Lord will choose within one of your tribal territories. There you must offer your burnt offerings and do everything I command you. But you may butcher your animals and eat their meat in any town you want. You want to have a barbecue with your stuff? That's fine. Praise God. All of you, whether ceremonially clean or unclean, may eat the meat just as now you eat gazelle and deer, but you must not consume the blood. You must pour it out on the ground like water. You can do what you want with your stuff, but with God's property, verse 17, you may not eat your offerings in your hometown, neither the tithe of your grain, 
and new wine and olive oil, nor the firstborn of your flocks and herds, nor any offering to fulfill a vow, nor your voluntary offerings, nor your sacred offerings. You must eat these in the presence of the Lord your God at the place he will choose. Eat them there with your children, your servants, and the Levites who live in your town, celebrating in the presence of the Lord your God in all you do. And be very careful never to neglect the Levites as long as you live in your land. And together we say, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Got to move a little quickly. Give me some grace as you always do. Four points. If you'll get your pens and pencils ready, type them into your phone. Speak very quietly to Siri. Four points we can pull from that big chunk of text that are so powerfully practical as it pertains to worship today. What worship is to look like to the Lord. If it's meaningful, if it's going to be significant, if it's going to be what he says worship is, it's got to look like these four things. And you could certainly come up with more. I only have time for four. Thank you. Four divine directives on what worship should look like today, what it should involve. And firstly, it's up on the screen, the prime directive of worship. Worship 101, the most important point of worship we see in verse 2 and 3 and 4. The first thing, before your financial giving, that's last on the list, the first thing is what we read here. Write it down. God demands exclusivity in worship. God demands, write it down, exclusivity in worship. Exodus 20, verse 2, God said so simply, I am the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. Symbolically, it's the same for we Christians. You must not have any other God but me. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I'll read it again. Will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. Someone said this, before anyone can worship God, please hear this, Christian, before anyone can worship God, there must be some places where he will no longer worship. There must be a destruction of the places where the ungodly worship, just as we read verses 2 through 4. Wreck, shop, tear it down, get destructive. Because our God will not tolerate any other affection for anyone or anything else. Someone else said, many could really begin to worship God in spirit and in truth if they would only destroy in their hearts They're pagan places of worship. Because they give their hearts to so many other things, there is little to give to the Lord. I pray this point is so set in our hearts, understood in our minds that we can practice this in our lives. Christians, brothers and sisters, do not ever think for a moment. Don't doubt. Don't confuse this essential point. Don't be deluded to think that we can go out into the world and entertain all the gods therein. Gods of greed, gods of lust, gods of violence, gods of pride, pleasure, sinful things. We can go out into the world and entertain ourselves by watching and listening and partaking and whatever the case may be. Sinful activities which represent idolatrous deities. Saturday night, throughout the week, whatever the case may be, and then walk into this sanctuary, lift up our hands to the Lord and say, Hallelujah, I love you, Lord, amazing grace, and every other such thing that we sing with our mouths. That's a verbal profession, and that's fine, but don't think that it means anything to God. That's not worship. I pray we understand this. Many do this. Many do that. You can do that. You can go out and live like hell, as it's been said, all week. Saturday night, you're doing your thing. You're bowing down to gods of all kinds. You can. 
you probably won't be struck dead. You can walk right in and sit in the front row and lift your hands and say hallelujah. People do this, but please understand the point. It's not worship. It's not worship to God. It's not meaningful to Him at all. If our affection to Him is not exclusive, our commitment to Him is not genuine. That's what the Bible says. If our affection for Him is not exclusive, our commitment to Him is not genuine. I'm thankful that the Lord gives us pictures and illustrations to help us understand truths in life. Amen? Realities of our relationship with Him. Isn't it interesting if you look into the old or even in the new, we Christians are called the bride of Christ. We're to relate to Him in a marital sense. That's the kind of connection that we have. That's the relationship. That's the kind of singular affection that we're to have for the Lord. Like a, like a chaste bride prepares herself for only her husband. And we enter into that secret garden that Solomon talked about. And that just describes a place of intimacy where no one else can go but husband and wife. No one else is allowed. Just between the man and woman, just between. And it's symbolic. You're not going to marry Jesus someday. It's to speak to me of the intensity, the purity that I'm to maintain in this relationship and my worship of such a God that has saved my soul. Just like a husband and wife, it's exclusive, it's private, it's personal. And if I choose to go outside of that relationship, it wrecks it, it ruins it, it makes it meaningless. It's called adulterous. And that's exactly the word that the scripture uses, Old Testament or New, to describe iniquity, sin. It's adultery, spiritually speaking. Because I'm choosing to love another uh, 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 in place of the one I've been engaged to, the one I'm betrothed to, the one that I, I said I choose you because you chose me, and so on and so forth. Listen to Isaiah chapter 1, verse 10, and I tell you, it's, it's terrible. Uh, you better brace yourselves. How God speaks to his people here, uh, it's powerful, but it's so very important because we're hearing the Lord's heart on what worship is and what worship is not. It's not the outward, but it's the inward. And this is brutal. The Lord says to Israel, He says, Listen to the Lord, you leaders of Sodom. Listen to the law of our God, people of Gomorrah. Not of Israel, governed by God, but of Sodom and of Gomorrah. That's powerful. What makes you think, and this is again in the New Living, God speaking, What makes you think I want all your sacrifices, says the Lord? I'm sick of your burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fattened cattle. I get no pleasure from the blood of bulls and goats and lambs. When you come to worship me, who asked you to parade through my courts with all your ceremony? Stop bringing me your meaningless gifts. The incense of your offerings disgusts me. As for your celebrations of the new moon and the Sabbath and your special days for fasting, they're all sinful and false. I want no more of your pious meetings. I hate your new moon celebrations and your annual festivals. They're a burden to me. I cannot stand them. When you lift up your hands in prayer, I will not look. Though you offer many prayers, I will not listen, for your hands are covered with the blood of innocent victims. Unrepented sin. Wash yourselves, God says. Wash yourselves and be clean. Get your sins out of my sight. Give up, listen, give up your evil ways. Learn to do good, seek justice, help the oppressed, defend the cause of orphans, fight for the rights of widows. And then this famous passage that we love so much. Come now. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Let's settle this, says our God. Though your sins are like scarlet, I'll make them as white as snow. Stop saying, stop pretending they don't exist. Stop coming into the sanctuary and just saying, oh, the blood of Jesus this and oh, the blood of Jesus that. Recognize your sin and repent or we can't have fellowship. There'll be no connection, no koinonia, no intimacy. Come now, the Lord says. 
Let's reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, I'll make them as white as snow. Though they're red like crimson, I'll make them white as wool. If you will obey me, you will have plenty to eat. But if you turn away and refuse to listen, you'll be devoured by the sword of your enemies. I, the Lord, have spoken. Coming to church does not cleanse you from your sin. Lifting your hands in worship to the Lord, giving financially to God, making verbal declarations, keeping feast or covenant or whatever the case may be, fellowshipping with your brothers and sisters. That's fun. It feels good. People will say things like, oh, didn't worship feel good today or the message just felt good or the conversation. It feels good to be in church and it's, it's true. It does. But that doesn't do a thing for you. Coming to church does not cleanse you of your sin. Coming to Jesus Christ certainly does. And thus we're exhorted here to make sure our heart is right. So that the fruit of our lips, if that's the kind of worship that in that moment we're offering, is pure and sincere before the Lord. Don't say you have no sin, but say, God, this is my sin. Own your actions. Don't act as though. You haven't committed them. Address your sin. Bring it to the one who loves you and who will freely forgive your sin. But listen, only if you ask him to. Only if you ask him to. God, I've loved other things. I've loved other people in all sorts of places. Forgive me. It's not right. It's wrong. It's sin. Strip me of this spiritual adultery. Forgive me of this iniquity. I just want to love you and worship you and be yours. The prime directive of worship, don't miss it, exclusivity. And let's not just amen that on a Sunday morning, though that's okay, let's practice that affection throughout the week. If idols creep into your life, and they do, don't they? They're sneaky. Sometimes we spot them and we're like, what in the world is that? And how did that get there? I didn't see it. I didn't feel that way about it. It kind of took me by surprise. That's how these things work. But we're responsible. We're accountable when we recognize them as such. If you've got idols in your life, idols in your heart, idols in your house, trash them. Destroy these things. Don't negotiate. Don't think you're strong enough to say, no, you're not. You'll stumble over and over and over and over and over and over again. I don't know why it takes so long for us to learn this. Hear it now. You don't have to go through years of up and down, up and down, in and out kind of of the church. In fellowship with the Lord and then out for six months. Clean house, wreck shop, destroy your idols. And when we enter into the sanctuary together, if there's been sin, if there's been a stumble, just confess it. Do what James tells us to do, chapter 4, verse 8, New Testament directive for you. Come close to God, he says. He's about to get brutal, but what does he say? Run far from the Lord, sinners. Nope, he says, come close to God. Get into the sanctuary, but there do business with God. Come close to God, and He will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. He's speaking to Christians. Our souls are forever cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? Your hands are dirty, though, aren't they? Your feet are filthy. Why? Because we live here, and we stumble, and we sin, and idols creep in. But I've got to, when I recognize them, destroy them, and remove them, and run from them. James says, come close to God. The way's been provided. Don't run from Him. Come close to Him, and He'll come close to you. What separates you from Him? Your sin. So address it. Repent of it. Get rid of it. Wash your hands, he says. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you've done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter, gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and He will lift you up in honor. Uh, The point is simple. Repent. Turn from your sin. 
Don't make light of it. Recognize it. Don't make excuse for it, but just lay it before the Lord and let him cleanse you of that unrighteousness. Don't think, don't think that we can come into this house and simply speak up words and expect that to mean anything to God if it doesn't come from your heart, which will be visible in your life. None of us are perfect, amen? But we can be cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, which is why we always tend to kind of include that in an opening prayer, kind of, sort of, in, in some way or another, amen? Because i got to get my heart straight before my worship to the Lord will be meaningful at all. It's an exclusive relationship. Blew a lot of time there. God help me. Secondly, another divine directive on what our worship should look like. You'll give me another hour, right? What? Some cultures do it. Secondly, God directs where we worship. Where? We worship. You see this in verse 5, verse 11, verse 13, verse 14, verse 17. You see it all over. We just read it. God directs where we worship. And believe it or not, but this is important. I'm thankful that the Lord tells his, pe his people, Israel here specifically, they were not free to determine where they should worship God. But there was a prescribed, designated place among the people of God, yes, but even the place was important. Someone said this, worship to God is not a do-as-you-please or a lone ranger activity. Someone said a particular place is important to worship. The man who tells himself, I can worship God just as well out on the golf course is a man, we just read this, is a man doing whatever is right in his own eyes. Listen, listen, before you get upset, listen. It is fine for him to worship God out on the golf course. Picking on golfers today. But there must also be a specific place where he comes to worship with God's people. One author gave some statistics on this issue. And he said, this principle, this point, this directive goes against the trend of our time. Studies find that among baby boomers, 70% say that you should attend worship services, not out of a sense of duty, I mean, heaven forbid, but only if it meets your needs. I don't have any needs, so what's the point? 80% say you can be a good Christian without attending church. You can worship God all you want. The point is, it's not significantly to him what worship is. Hebrews 10.23, read this with me. And note the use of personal pronouns here. I said to the first service, it's fantastic to tear this text apart and, and, and study it a little bit more intensely. Firstly, Paul says, or the author declares, let us... Uh, individually, personally, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Your individual opportunity and responsibility as a Christian privately, personally, is to hold fast without wavering to the hope the return of Christ that God has, has given to us. We trust that God will keep his promise. So hold fast, hold tight to the promises of God. In essence, we could say, as it's declared elsewhere, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Take your Christianity seriously, personally, privately. But then again, Paul, the author here, verse 24, use of personal pronouns cause us to look beyond ourselves, to examine other Christians in the body of Christ, he then says, verse 24, stay with me, let us corporately together think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Your Christianity isn't all about you, but others in the body need you. He says, verse 25, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do. Interesting that they in that day have the same problem we do today, right? Isn't that fascinating? They didn't have TV or movie screens. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now, that the day of the Lord's return is drawing near. 
Why is this point so important? God directs where we worship. His house, his, the spot that he designates for us. I think there's a lot to be said on that. Why is it so important that we come together and congregate in the place to which he's directed us? It's important because firstly, God says it right here in Hebrews 10, 23, you shouldn't need any other reason than that. Let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Oh, but save your butts, right? God says, don't forsake the assembling of, don't do that. Some will, but not you. Why? The body of Christ needs you and you need the body of Christ. It's interesting what happens to an isolated Christian. I could tell you lots of stories, don't have the time. I'll just say this. We have the tendency to get really, really weird when we're all alone by ourselves. We just get strange and our minds get warped and we start seeing things in a very peculiar sort of way. It's kind of how cults get started and people drink poison. And I mean, there's a lot of just weird stuff that goes on. We need the body of Christ because the body of Christ is bigger than us. I need to be a part of it because there's accountability in it. And it's because it's God's design for my life. We see that in Ephesians 4.11. This is our, our fellowship's kind of theme verse. It's why church fellowship is so important. Paul says, And he himself, that is God, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying or building up of the body of Christ. Till we all come. You may be super awesome, but I'm not, and so help me out. We're working in this together. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect or mature man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, until we're all built up and made like Him. You need church. The church needs you. Don't neglect it. Don't forsake the assembling of the body, the family. Someone said this lastly, those on the outside of the church will always be on the fringes of the faith. Every single time I believe that to be true. Thirdly, our third point is closely tied to the second. We see some similarities between them as we seek to define practically what worship looks like, what God says worship to Him is. It's exclusive. He directs where we worship and he decides number three he decides with whom we worship we see this in verse 7 write it down verse 12 verse 18 it's so vitally important that we come together and and worship God purely as we said previously but with write this down with the entire family with the whole family. God decides with whom we worship. And we could say that that's other Christians, and that's true. Who else would be into church? Church is weird, right? That was a church joke. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. It's just, it's kind of weird here what we do to the outsider. Of course, we understand that there's a lot more going on than what seems to be. Amen? So we gather corporately with other Christians. I think you could even talk about here which particular fellowship or church you attend. That's important. God has, I believe, a designated home fellowship church for every one of us, and we need to find out what that is. But primarily, look at these verses. Look at this passage. Verse 7, verse 12, verse 18. God decides with whom we worship, and primarily in this context the exhortation is all about each individual Israelite's family. Your family, your spouse, husbands, your wife, uh, your kids, the individual, any, any servants you got in your house, because you all have those, right? You're to bring them to. The whole family is to come together and worship God in purity. Verse 7, let's just read it. Uh, Moses says, There you and your families will feast in the presence of the Lord your God. You will rejoice as we do on Sunday mornings in all you've accomplished because the Lord your God has blessed you. Verse 12 says, You must celebrate there in the presence of the Lord your God with what? 
your sons and daughters and all your servants, all of them. That's interesting as we think this point through today, isn't it? The whole worship God, come together and worship God in purity with the whole family. Now, I realize there are extenuating circumstances to this point. But nonetheless, it's right in front of our face. Your job is not to defend yourself against me, but to just answer whatever the Holy Spirit might say to you, because I don't know. Amen? Agreed? Think this through practically. It may seem simple. It may seem silly, but how often these days professing Christian families are disjointed when it comes to their Christian fellowship, attending church, worshiping the Lord together. How often? Someone's there and the other's not. It's fascinating. It's telling, if you will. There are lots of good reasons. Junior's got a soccer game. My daughter's got a, a football game. As we said to the first service, mom's hunting and dad's shopping, hitting the mall, shooting the turkeys. It's, the point is this, it's always or frequently something, isn't it? Someone's missing just, just all the time. The family is so rarely all together coming in their service to, uh, which is their worship of, God, the family's disjointed. God says, I don't like that. Disjointed is a very interesting word. It means dislocated, separated, divided, disconnected, severed, split. I love what Webster said. He said, disjointed, not connected in an easily understandable way. Wow, that makes me feel silly. It's easy to understand why the family's not connected or disjointed is because there's no central theme. There's no foundation. There's no priority that supersedes anyone and anything else in life. And that is our worship of God as a family. It's interesting, oftentimes that in the church we think we have all the answers, and we do, right? but we hold them and, and oftentimes we don't follow them. So it's interesting to, to put your ear to the, to the world and listen. And oftentimes they're preaching like our material. <laughs> and we're not listening. We're, not, we're like, that's the world. That's worldly counsel. And they're like quoting biblical principle or something like that. Have you ever discovered that to be true? That's God's way of taking us down a few notches in our own minds to say, wow, the world's saying what I should be doing. Okay. Thank you, Lord. Help me to get back to what you say is true. The world recognizes that we've got problems in our culture. The world recognizes that our society is fragmented. And the counsel that's, that's given is so synonymous with our study today. Family is the solution, they say. Imagine that. Coming, coming together, being together, you know, as a family, even just having dinner four nights a week, even that, a phenomenal effect that it'll have on your family. This is what the world says. This is what crazy people we disagree with and CNN and, and liberal Democrats and all these other guys that we say we don't like so much. They get it and we need to do it. All of our social problems. Do you know that divorce is now worse in the church than it is in the world? The statistics are higher in the church, divorce, than in the world. That blows my mind. We say love is lacking. We say compassion. Who even know, knows what that means anymore, we say. And society will tell us that it all comes back to the family. Keeping the family close. Coming together often as a family. And that's exactly what the Lord says here. This is so important. Dad, and this primarily falls on you. You're going to answer to the Lord for it. But moms, you too, make Christian fellowship, attending church together, make it a priority above all others in your life. The Lord said, and we read, choose for yourself a blessing or a curse. That's what you can do. It's not legalism. Do what you want. 
Do with this what you will. I pray you choose wisely. Choose for yourself a blessing or a curse. Choose life that you may live. Our families are to be our simplest and greatest testimony to the world that God is real. And it's my opinion that this is done very simply when the Lord, there is no question, the Lord is the priority above all others in our life. Imagine a Sunday morning where you come together, you know, the whole family around the breakfast table and you, you get to prepare yourselves for church service and you get to pray for your teachers and this one especially. And, and Thank you, thank you. And, and you get to prepare yourself for service and you get to say, well, well this is the class. You get to share a little bit, strategize here and there. Uh, the need for rides to church was brought up today. You get to say, hey, let's go pick up that saint. Even if they have a car, let's go pick them up anyway and enjoy the fellowship, engage in some service. Uh, let's create a dynamic that's built around fellowship with the Lord. On the drive home, as each one kind of goes to their different classrooms and studies, you get to share, well, what the Lord speak to you? And, and what the teacher teach to you and you get to see that it's kind of all the same thing even though you were in different parts of the Bible isn't that amazing oh but we like to head up into the hills on Sundays oh but we encounter the Lord as a family in hiking or camping or fishing or whatever the case may be that's our family time that's our fellowship wonderful those things are great amen those things are great. I find it interesting that the Lord's given you six days to do whatever you want. What? You want to go fishing? That's great. That's wonderful. That's what Saturdays are for. Not many laughs. You, you like to go hike up in the hills and encounter God and creation and teach your kids with leaves and stones? That's wonderful. Saturday's perfect for that. Six days God has given you. Do whatever you want with them. Sunday's His. Sunday's called the Lord's Day. Make it about Him. Worship in the way that He says is meaningful to me. That's meaningful to me. When you bring the whole family and you're all kind of there and you're thus all on the same page and this fragmented society is going to come together quite quickly. Make your worship meaningful to God by always involving the whole family. I encourage you. It's far from legalism. It's just plain wisdom. You'll be so blessed. You'll, you'll see your kids rise up and call you blessed if you, if you do, if you will. Amen? Fourthly, finally, lastly, and we'll be done. I'm not going to go quick, though. God declares the heart of worship. God declares the heart of worship. And of course, that's in regard to, we see it throughout this passage, verse 6, verse 11, verse 17, verse 18, the giving of our tithes and offerings. What's meaningful worship to God? Songs? Yep, that's sweet. But the heart of worship is sacrificial or financial giving. Deuteronomy 16, great Great chapter, great passage. God says, when all you dudes come together and worship me, don't come empty-handed. Come with the present. Come with an offering. And I'll have to move quickly. I'll try and paraphrase these verses that talk about our tithes, our offerings to the Lord a little bit. We see in this passage that God's people were free to enjoy all that He'd given to them however they saw fit. All that was theirs, all that in His grace He had afforded them, do with it whatever you want. Barbecue all the time. Invite all the friends and neighbors over. But when it comes to the tithe, the first tenth off the top, when it comes to the offerings of worship, they were not free to do with them whatever they saw fit. They were to bring both the tithe and the offerings to His house that designated place of worship that he had called them to attend, the tabernacle, the temple, whatever the case may be. We see a lot of these same principles for giving in the New Testament. We're to give freely, hilariously. I love that verse. It just means with exuberant joy. 
No strings attached, no ulterior motives. You give and expect nothing in return. What's the problem with giving? Amen? Oh, God, he makes me give a tithe and calls me to give an offering. Uh, grumble, grumble, grumble. Do you understand that 100% of your income is a gift of God? And we whine about giving 10% back or uh, a, a hilarious offering every now and then. Uh, all of it is a gift of grace to you. You have a back that can work and hands that can function and a mind that can earn you a living. And that's due to the grace of God. He's given you that paycheck. And he calls you to give what's healthy for you and what honors and glorifies him. A tithe. A free will offering. These guys just gave back to the Lord a certain portion of what he had given to them. Symbolically, practically, we kind of get this when it comes to giving. But symbolically is where I want to focus our study for just a minute before we close, because symbolically, this is powerful, and it's such a parallel. For the church, we New Covenant Christians today, it's interesting that in this chapter we see it so specifically over and over again that Israel was commanded of God to give to the place where they themselves would, in turn, be refreshed and filled and fed. And you see that over and over again. Verse 12 says, You must celebrate there in the presence of the Lord your God with your sons and daughters and all your servants. After Israel came and offered those sweet sacrifices, those offerings to the Lord that we talked about in this chapter, there was a portion, there was a part of that offering that the priest would pull back and return to them and they'd sit down as a whole family, servants and all, and enjoy it together and say, look at what God has given to us. This is great. They were refreshed. They were filled. They were fed. They were satisfied. They were satiated by what they had already given to the Lord. It's incredible to me. Each family, every family blessed by what they themselves gave to the Lord. We miss that today, don't we? Maybe it's not you, and it's probably not. But oftentimes it's just grumbling when it comes to giving, and we just miss it. Do you understand right now you are being satisfied and satiated and filled? and oh, It just, yeah, oh, yes. The meat and the milk of the word, I, I love it. The presence of the Lord, I'm being so refreshed and blessed. Do you know how that's happening? is because someone gave financially. Those chairs you're sitting in weren't free, right? As you walk out, look at everything, the, the sound and everything that's, that's propelling the Word of God and making uh, me audible, visual. The air condition, you love that, don't you? The bathrooms you're going to use, the parking lot that we lease, we pay for that. I'm not even going to get into our smud bill or how much rent we pay. Listen, you're being refreshed right now. There's no money trees in the back. There's no angels that slip us a few bucks, the old Pentecostal handshake. Thanks, Gabriel. You're being refreshed right now because of what you have given. You're receiving it back, aren't you? You're receiving what others have given if you don't give it all, and frankly, you should. It's amazing, and it's synonymous. It's symbolic so much of us today. There will always be a direct connection. Listen, there will always be a direct connection between the ministry that we will see and what God's people give practically or financially. I'll say it again. There will always be a direct connection between the ministry that we see and what God's people give practically, financially. Imagine if no offering was given. Okay, well, don't expect a blessing. I mean, think that through. Uh, <clears throat> priest, can I have some of his sheep or some of that wine offering or some of that oil? No, bring an offering and I'll give you part back, right? Oftentimes people come to church, we, we, we say we live in a transient age, and I know I don't have the time. People church hop, Joel talked about last week, Pastor Joel, so frequently from one church, I'm not satisfied, I'm not satiated, I'm not fulfilled. It's because you're not giving anything of yourself to that ministry, Start giving and you may start receiving something back spiritually, symbolically from the place where you like to eat. I like that. I can wrap my head around that. 
Pastor Joel was here last week. How do you think he serves in Belize for 12 years? They're all kids there. They're all teenagers and young people. They don't tithe much. He sustains the work of the ministry because of what God's people give financially. How are Steve and Marina, our missionaries in Southeast Asia, how are they still there right now because of what you give and what the church affords them to go and to do that work? We kind of miss the practicality of giving, don't we? We miss how significant this worship, this form of worship is to the Lord because our eyes are on the wrong thing. There are so many opportunities we have to further the gospel, but I tell you, they're often limited because the giving is light. I will say this. If you want to see God move, you know we say that sometimes, we're like, yeah, I want to see God move, and I want to see people get saved, and that's what we want, right? Write a check. Be refreshed. and sa- How do you think VBS happened last week? It's because you give, and you gave, and you're going to give. And that's how all these, these 86 kids come in here and dance around, and almost half of them don't attend this fellowship because you handed out flyers. It's incredible, right? If you want to see God start doing something, if you want to be refreshed by the work of the Lord and receive that blessing, then give. Give abundantly. Amen? It also blesses the Levites. I love that the Lord twice in this section makes mention of those who serve God's people in regard to spiritual things. Man, they eat from what you give. So support your local Levite, right? (laughs) Summing up this point and then coming to a close, Moses teaches us to give freely out from what God has already graciously given to you. Honor him for what he's given you and give where you like to eat. This is important. Give where you like to eat. Give where you'll receive something back Uh, refreshment, spiritually speaking, what you have given. Give your money wherever you want to, but give God's tithe, God's offering, to the place that he's designated for you. Amen? In closing, and thank you so much for your grace, I pray these directives for worship mean something to us today. I pray, and, and I know it's the case with most all, and I pray all of us, but we desire that our lives would be well-pleasing to him, that our worship would be sweet in his sight. If that's true, then apply this wisdom from the word of God. We see it simply right in front of our faces. You'll be blessed if you do, and you will not if you don't. Jesus said, John 4, verse 24, and this is what it comes down to. He says, for God is spirit. Listen, so those who worship him must. I can't get away from that word. How about you? So those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Jesus didn't say, oh, just worship God. Paint a picture for Jesus Whatever you feel, however you want to worship God, just just worship Him. That's all that matters, this loose nonsense that we hear so much of today. He says if we want to worship God, we must worship in spirit and in what? Truth. That's what you heard today. And so take these things into consideration. Amen? Father, we thank you for your word, Lord, and we thank you that your word as always is just more than the time we have. Lord, let that encourage and cause just greater study, uh, an increased, intense examination of these things, just to see, Lord, what you would say. Thank you that our worship to you is not all about finances. It's part of it, but it starts, God, with exclusive love. You shall love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. If you want to worship me, it's got to be only me. Worship with the people I've called you to. Worship where I designate to you. And don't come empty-handed. Bring a gift. Bring your finances. Bring an offering. Write a check and be so blessed. See how I refresh you when you do. Lord, help us to understand so clearly today what worship looks like. And then to uh, apply it, to do it, Lord, for your glory, for our good, for our kids to see. In Jesus' name, bless your people, Lord. 
Amen.